Good morning. This is the House Health Care Committee. It's Wednesday, April 14th, uh, just a few minutes after 9 a.m. So this morning, our committee is turning our attention to sections of a Senate bill, S3, um, which deals with issues of mental health services and corrections in part, or in large part, and has come over from the Senate with several provisions that, but it is, it is a bill that is currently in the House Judiciary Committee. But the chair of that committee has asked for the House Healthcare Committee where we have jurisdiction over issues of mental health and healthcare, uh, has asked for our review and input to in particular several sections, but the, the entirety of the, the bill and we have this morning invited several witnesses uh, to testify. And then uh, it's an opportunity for us to talk amongst ourselves, have some committee discussion and perhaps, and make some uh, proposals, uh, possibly make some proposals to uh, the language that's come over to the House Judiciary Committee. So with that, uh, I guess I'll start by welcoming uh, Deputy Commissioner of the Department of Mental Health, Morning Fox, who uh, we've invited and has joined us. And I understand that you, in many ways, are taking, have taken, uh, in part, the lead on some of these issues. Is that? And so let, let me just uh, welcome you and have you introduce yourself, and then we'll begin by inviting your thoughts on what's in S3, and then entertaining, hopefully, entertaining questions from committee members. Sure. No. Thank you, Chair Lippert. Uh, for the record, Morning Fox, uh, Deputy Commissioner, Department of Mental Health. Uh, I'd like to just begin by thanking the committee for taking the time uh, to review this bill. Uh, as Chair Lippert mentioned, uh, it has been something that I've really pretty much taken the lead on for the department uh, in regards to uh, the, uh, the provisions within S3. Uh, S3 actually began in the last biennium uh, as a, uh, a separate bill uh, that was known as S183 uh, <clears throat> at the time and uh, was revived, if you will, uh, this session uh, under the moniker of S3 uh, and uh, began as close to S183 uh, at, at that time. It's gone under some revisions uh, to the point where uh, you have the, the copy now that uh, was passed by the Senate uh, earlier uh, during this session. Um, the uh, provisions of this bill are uh, pieces that are what I see as very important in our system of care. Um, it's been uh, a longstanding issue, one that I've testified on in many times in regards to uh, the intersection of the criminal justice system and the mental health system. Uh, individuals who come into the mental health system through the criminal justice system uh, have continually come into uh, complexities that place uh, the Department of Mental Health, the criminal justice system, uh, public safety, and treatment uh, all at uh, uh, a crossroads, if you will, uh, sometimes at odds with each other, sometimes uh, in sync. Uh, one comment that I know that has been put out there at, at some times is that the Department of Mental Health uh, does not uh, uh, engage in public safety. And I want to just clarify that that's not accurate, um, that, uh, it's not our primary goal, like the Department of Public Safety uh, in that sense. Uh, however, uh, there are safety concerns that uh, the Department of Mental Health and providers uh, do have to take into consideration when treating individuals. Um, this bill contemplates several different aspects. Uh, it contemplates change, some changes in how and when uh, particular evaluations are, are, uh, um, are achieved, uh, in particular, the separation of competency and sanity evaluations when both are being ordered, uh, the 
provision that is uh, in this bill uh, basically suggests that when a competency and sanity evaluation are being proposed, that the sanity evaluation uh, be held until the evaluator can uh, uh, make an opinion or form an opinion that the individual is competent uh, to stand trial. And at that point, if they feel that the individual is competent to stand trial, that they would go forward with their sanity evaluation uh, and creating two separate reports. Uh, this is an, an industry uh, standard uh, supported by uh, the Association of uh, Psychiatry and Law, uh, the overarching National Association of Forensic Evaluators uh, is also uh, recommended by uh, the Bar Association that they be uh, separated, as well as there are other states uh, that have done uh, similar uh, legislation to separate these, these types of evaluations. Um, this bill also contemplates uh, various pieces of notification uh, to help provide notification for uh, victims of, of crimes. Um, or uh, victims of, uh, uh, well, the crime existed, but whether or not an individual is the actual perpetrator or not uh, may not be determined, especially if someone is incompetent to stand trial and it hasn't been necessarily determined that that individual did commit uh, the alleged offense. Uh, however, there are still victims that are involved. And so this uh, bill does contemplate uh, the ability for the department to notify the state's attorneys or attorney generals if they happen to be prosecuting the case uh, that uh, an individual that is under the care and custody of the commissioner uh, in a secure setting, if they're being discharged from a secure setting uh, that, uh, or from custody, that the department would notify that state's attorney uh, of that information that they are being discharged uh, from custody or from a secure setting so as to be able to notify uh, any potential victims uh, so that they're aware uh, that uh, the individual that is, had been alleged to have committed uh, the act uh, may no longer be in a secure setting. Uh, this bill then goes on to contemplate um, notification of the state's attorneys or attorney generals for individuals who are in the community on orders of non-hospitalization. Uh, and uh, we have spoken out against this provision uh, on the notification for ONHs. Uh, I've been following the testimony quite closely and I don't believe I've heard any testimony yet that has supported uh, the inclusion of, of this in the, uh, in the bill. And it's my understanding that uh, and hope that uh, House Judiciary is looking to strike that, it, that language from, from the bill. Uh, the ONH notification piece uh, is quite concerning as it does relate to more detailed information, uh, uh, really getting into uh, protected health information, how a person is engaging in treatment. It is also fraught with concerns as to what, what is meant by the intent of uh, that they are not following their, their order of non-hospitalization. It creates uh, conflicts between the treatment providers as well as uh, uh, the person that they're providing treatment for. Uh, a main and significant bedrock of, of treatment for any individual uh, is having a solid trusting relationship between the individual and uh, their therapeutic provider. And having that therapeutic provider basically having to play the role of sort of a probation officer and uh, letting an individual know we will have to notify the department to notify the courts if you miss an appointment, miss a dose of medication, uh, you know, do something else that's a, uh, contrary to your order of non-hospitalization. Those types of, of events do happen while people are in orders of non-hospitalization, but it's not always indicative of a person doing poorly uh, or uh, that their treatment is not sufficient. And so it's been our suggestion as well as others that this language be struck from the bill and, and live in the uh, study section uh, of this bill. And from my perspective, the language uh, should include that 
we would look at, at this provision and determine if it should be included and if so, how. Uh, and, uh, and so that's a, a major piece of that. Um, the uh, other, other major provisions uh, that we'll likely talk about further as well are the uh, corrections assessment on mental health services. Uh, oh, yes. You're muted. <laughs> yeah, right. So, sorry, unmute myself. Um, so this is very helpful, uh, Deputy Commissioner, to have you walk through this. I'm wondering if before moving, because I think you were about to move on to sections five and six, is that right? Yes, sir. Could, because, and, and I think there's more, there's certainly more to talk about there. Uh, but I'm wondering if we could just make sure that we understand the department's position on each of the provisions in the earlier sections, because you've, okay. you've, met, you've spoken to one of those sections and said that you recommend its removal. You've described some of the other sections, but have not, at least in my mind, I didn't necessarily understand what, whether the department had a position on those other provisions. And I think in the interest of clarity, it might be helpful to, before going on to sections five and six, where I think there, I, I anticipate there'll be a considerable more discussion to walk through the first, the first to, to revisit the provisions you've described sure. and indicate what the department's position is or is not on each of those. Is that, would that work for you? That's perfectly fine. Yeah, that would be great. So uh, in section one, uh, part two, which is on the top of page two of S3, uh, that's where it discusses the separation of uh, sanity and competency evaluations. Um, and we are in support of, of that language. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, it is a, an industry best practice right. standard. Um, and so we definitely support, support that provision. Yeah, you had, of course, said that previously, and I draw, drew an assumption from that, but I, but I, I think it'd be helpful just to be, to be explicit. Yeah. I'm trying to be as explicit as I can without getting too explicit. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, in regards to uh, the notification pieces, um, when an individual is... is well, is, uh, section, is section two... Isn't there a section two that has to do with uh, council? And maybe, oh yeah, sorry, maybe my apologies. Not weighing in on that. Yes, no, my apologies. Uh, we definitely support in section two, uh, Vermont legal aid uh, having party status uh, and representing uh, individuals in these uh, in in these cases. Uh, in that the mental health law project uh, and Vermont legal aid. Uh, have the expertise and knowledge of the system, and believe that, and we believe that they can best represent uh, the defendants uh, when we're talking about uh, commitment cases when an individual is found uh, incompetent to stand trial uh, or uh, not guilty by reason of insanity in looking at hospitalization hearings, uh, things of that sort. Uh, we also support the department having the ability to call witnesses uh, and be present. Uh, in these hearings as well. Uh, as happens currently, we do not have party status in criminal court proceedings. And so it is not, uh, I, I don't want to necessarily say it's common, but it's, it's definitely not uncommon that the department and the designated agencies are unaware of the outcomes uh, of criminal court cases in, that are being resolved uh, with either orders of hospitalization or orders of non-hospitalization as a result of an indi individual being found by the court as either incompetent to stand trial or not guilty by reason of insanity. And so this would allow us uh, to A, be aware of this information and to best advocate for whether or not uh, an individual should be hospitalized uh, and meets that, that level of care and need uh, or whether uh, they're uh, their treatment needs would be best met uh, in the community on an order of non-hospitalization. Okay. Then going into uh, section three, uh, mm -hmm. 
on the notification provisions. When an individual is uh, determined to be incompetent to stand trial uh, and their charges are, the, the way this bill is written, uh, it, it, uh, it looks at uh, and envisions that the department would notify state's attorneys or attorney generals uh, when we're discharging an individual who has been uh, found incompetent to stand trial and their charges have been dismissed. Uh, and so if their charges have been dismissed, there would be no notification uh, of, of a discharge. Only when the state's attorney or attorney general keeps charges open would there be at that time that if we're discharging an individual from a secure setting or from the care and custody of the commissioner that we would notify the state's attorney uh, or attorney general if they're prosecuting the case uh, for the reason to notify victims of that release. Uh, we're, we're good with that language. We're comfortable with that. Uh, we feel from a, from a HIPAA perspective that uh, uh, we're, A, we're providing the least amount of information possible in that all we're really notifying the state's attorney is the individual is being discharged. Uh, from a secure setting, not to where they're going, not to what their diagnosis is, not to what their treatment has been, uh, solely that they're being discharged. And as long as there's a, a criminal court case, it helps us to feel more comfortable about sharing that information. Uh, we're also aware that uh, there are many other states that have similar provisions and the Federal regulators uh, and and uh, other federal agencies have not taken uh, uh, any concern with other states providing this, and so again, that has made us feel comfortable that uh, this falls within the confines of uh, not not being in violation of uh, of HIPAA uh, in that sense. As far as not guilty by reason of insanity. Uh, if a person is adjudicated but as not guilty by reason of insanity, uh, we would provide that same notification to the state's attorneys. Uh, and the way this is, is written and it is envisioned is that for cases of not guilty by reason of insanity, uh, it does not limit it to whether or not the charges were dismissed or not. Uh, and Again, I think the department is, is good with, with that, uh, given that historically here in Vermont, uh, NGRI adjudication is extremely rare. Uh, and when it does happen, it's almost always for extremely violent uh, types of crimes. Uh, and so again, because of the narrow scope of the information that we would be providing to the state's attorneys, we again still feel comfortable in being able to provide that information uh, and not being in uh, violation of, uh, of HIPAA. You're on mute. Thank you. Uh, uh, morning, Fox. Did you use Fox? Did you use an acronym that I did? I, as soon as I would you, just, would you just please share what that stood for? Because I'm not sure yes. everyone will. Yes, as soon as I said it, I knew I needed to clarify. Uh, NGRI yeah, that's uh, what I thought. Yeah. is uh, the acronym for not guilty by reason of insanity. Got it. Okay. It's just that some of us are, don't live and eat these acronyms. So I, I was sitting here going, I know I know what that means, but I can't. <laughs> right. I thought maybe right. that might, might, might not be the only one. No, and I, and I apologize too, because, you know, my history uh, is having worked in a uh, forensic facility uh, before uh, that was run in another state. Um, and I ran their maximum security units there, providing evaluations uh, and assessments and court testimony uh, related to cases. And so it's just, just a part of my vernacular and I apologize. I, no, okay, well, thank you for clarifying it, okay. So let's see. Um, other provisions. Uh, da, 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 da. There is a uh, provision as well. I believe it's section four of this bill. Uh, 
then goes on into uh, page seven, uh, section. Uh, so just just to clarify, that the, the section that you talked about previously, the ONH, the department does not support and correct. recommends that uh, that's part of section three that that recommends to put it in the study. And if it's in the study to say, if it's included, if so, how, if it should be, if this should be done, how should it be done? Correct. Mike, I, I don't want to put words in your mouth. I think that was close to what you were saying. It's not clear that department is, is still just a little uneasy about this type of notification in general. And so I yes. think we need to discuss that and the HIPAA yes. implications uh, and whether or not this is even feasible uh, within yes. HIPAA. And then if so, then how, how would this work? Uh, because again, there's yeah. a lot of information and for what purposes. Yes, okay, and I, I think has been communicated informally to at least some of us uh, that it is the intention of the House Judiciary Committee to delete that section from the current, their redraft of the bill. That's my understanding anyway. Uh, Representative Donahue? Yeah, oh, I, I, I've, been, I have some other hands here too. Okay, just very quickly on that, I've been listening in um, to testimony. And ye yesterday afternoon, actually, the Center for Crime Victim Services testified and would like to see it removed. So just for folks to be th that perspective. Well, want, they want it in the study, but they think as, as it is now, it shouldn't be included. So. OK. Uh, Representative Peterson, and, or right. Representative Goldman, and Representative Peterson. I think, I think we're going to take some questions now before we move on so that we, if, sure. if there are questions, yeah. You may have said this, but I'm not understanding. Um, and thank you and good morning. I'm sorry. Good morning. Um, what an ONH is a non hospitalization order. What What does that mean, like logistically? Like, what what happened? What, where does the person go? Sure. So, really, what an order of non hospitalization is is that an individual is being uh, placed under the care and custody of the commissioner. Uh, it's a form of commitment. Um, there's two types of commitments that where an individual can be placed under the care and custody of the commit of the commissioner, either an order of hospitalization, where they're uh, ordered under the care and custody of the commissioner and placed in a hospital, or an order of non-hospitalization, uh, which places an, an individual under the care and custody of the commissioner, however, that their treatment uh, can be provided in the community. Uh, and so an order of non-hospitalization, the the, the language of the order of the order itself will have many ver many variables. Uh, it can be as as limiting as uh, an order of non hospitalizations that says uh, you need to live at a secure residence like the Middlesex Therapeutic Community Residence, uh, and it needs to be that specific that a judge has to order an individual to that specific location and that they require that level of of security. Generally, otherwise, orders of non-hospitalizations will have uh, provisions in it that are generally, the general types of provisions you'll see are that you'll continue to engage with your treatment team, you'll take medications as prescribed, uh, maybe live in a mutually acceptable, uh, uh, you know, residence, uh, you know, things of that sort um, and, and whatnot. Um, and... Uh, and generally, if a person is in violation of their uh, order of non-hospitalization, the designated agency is really the, the arm of the department that kind of uh, operationalizes the order. And so it's really up to the designated agency to determine. So if an individual missed a dose of medication, is that something that is concerning? Is that something that should require, you know, revision of their order, you know, do they, you know, those types of things. Uh, quite frequently what happens on an order of non-hospitalization, if an individual say, does decide to not take a medication or skips an appointment with providers, they're going to work to continue uh, that treatment in the community. Uh, if they're unsuccessful in kind of maintaining that engagement, the designated agency can then come back to the department and recommend either an amendment to their order of non-hospitalization or... Oops, you just went silent. Fox, Fox, we can't hear you. You've gone silent. 
<laughs> Some can't hear you. Yeah. At what point did you guys lose me? <laughs> About a minute or so ago. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is my problem with Zoom, and I apologize. That's why you just saw me. I've just moved my keyboard away so I can be close to my laptop. My laptop apparently likes to just intermittently decide to mute me and mute my speakers as well. Um, it, it didn't show you officially muted, but you suddenly the sound was gone. Yeah. So in an... I think you were saying <laughs> that in order of hospital, not hospitalization, uh, that you try to engage that the community, the designated agency will try to engage with them. They'll determine whether like is missing one medication, uh, is that is that rise to a level of having to do anything further or just to right. re-engage the client? But that there, there could come a point which, and I think this is where you may, we may have lost you. Is there could come a point where the agency would deter, as the arm of the department may determine <laughs> that they may determine that there's a need to either amend the order of non-hospitalization, um, or uh -oh. that's, that's exactly what happened before. That's the point. At the same You're, moment, they don't want us to know. Yeah, yeah. I think I think when they get to the word revoke, maybe that's the word I keep thinking so, you're about to say. But they they could either seek to amend the uh, order of non hospitalization or to seek to completely revoke uh, the order of non hospitalization, thus converting the order of non hospitalization into an order of hospitalization. Um, and uh, and we tried to do that in conjunction with the designated agency and 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 uh, the department. Uh, you know, because we're also looking at how is the individual doing and do they actually kind of meet criteria for needing to be hospitalized. Uh, and so generally, you know, missing a dose of, you know, one's medication is not indicative of needing to be hospitalized. Uh, more so a pattern of that or an increasing in their sy symptoms uh, and dangerousness, uh, things of that sort uh, would be more indicative of, of the, the need for a complete revocation of one's order of non-hospitalization. Could I ask one more question? Please, yeah. Um, is it possible that an individual would be in the community or they are always going to be in a supervised setting because you're saying miss one dose of medication, so I'm just trying to picture that dynamic. It, it varies from individual to individual. Uh, some individuals on orders of non-hospitalization may be living in their own apartment. Some may be living in a, in a congregate group home type setting or intensive residential. Um, at the secure residential, everyone there is, you know, by statute has to be on an order of non-hospitalization. Thank you. On, on, on this point, uh, Fox, would you, could you give us some general sense, I'm not specific to the number, but, but many, there are numbers of people on orders of non-hospitalization. This is not a rare situation, is right. it? No, there's, there's roughly, 300 plus individuals at any given time uh, on an order of non-hospitalization. Don't quote me on the number, but yeah, but, but that's, that's just that's a rough just, area. Yeah. So just to give members a sense that this is not like an exception that's done with just a handful of people. Uh, Representative, sorry, I'm, sorry. I'm, well, yeah, just to jump in on the number, about how many do you know roughly how many per year actually get revoked and a person needs to be re-hospitalized? Or is it fairly rare or is it fairly frequent? I'd say it's more rare than frequent. Uh, anecdotally, a dozen or more maybe uh, in a given year. It's, it's not a large number. It's not in the hundreds by, by, by any means. Yeah. Right, okay, thank you. Uh, Representative Peterson, you had a question still. Y yes, thank you, uh, Chair. Um, my my question is, has uh, changed as we I've listened here a little bit. Um, and you you sent or Representative Donahue you sent an email uh, outlining the section that I guess judiciary is removed from the bill, and, and I think that's the same language that Morning Fox indicated did not. But just a general overall question. Is that removal going to make victims less safe? Not in my opinion, no. Um, with with that information, it was the way this language was written. Basically, uh, a designated agency is kind of through us would be required to 
we, we'd have to notify a state's attorney if an individual missed an appointment. And frankly, I think then if a state's attorney receives that information and tells a victim, what are they to do with that information? It, it's not really helpful. It could create more anxiety, in fact, uh, and really kind of increase someone's trauma response, uh, not really having much information that they can do anything right. with. And I think that's kind of the part of the basis of some of our concern with that section. Aside from the, the HIPAA, we're talking about a medication that someone missed, a treatment you know, session that someone missed. They didn't come to this type of treatment. You know, they didn't take this type of medicine. And we're really starting to get into much more protected health information. And again, from a victim notification piece, I don't see it as very helpful to an individual to just be told someone missed an appointment. And right. like, do we tell them then next week they missed one again? Yeah. Um, and then three weeks later, they missed a dose? Gotcha. Thanks for your patience. I, I, I was trying to put it all together sure. as we went well, here. And, and and again, if I may, uh, I, and this is this is indirect, but or in informal, but Representative Donahue, having been following the testimony in House Judiciary, I think you mentioned that Center for Crime Victim Services were also asking to have this section removed. So they they their their role is particularly looking out for the interests of victims. I think that is actually for the exact reason that the Deputy Commissioner just said that it could be creating false impressions about what's happening with the particular individual so but that it would still be put potentially still be put into the study uh that would be followed up uh which, when we get to those next sections as to maybe that should be changed revised uh, modified in some way okay. so if i may add the vermont medical society document also is supporting that change right there's a document in our website okay i'm you're ahead of me. Okay. <laughs> I was just looking through the documents. Yeah. Well, we're going to hear from them uh, at noon or at 10 o'clock, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Great. And as I said earlier, too, I've been following this very closely. I've been in almost all the testimonies, whether I'm testifying or not. Um, and I've yet to hear anyone testify in support of keeping that uh, provision in. Okay. So, uh, Representative Page. Um, yes, Deputy Commissioner. And maybe this will be part of the study, but at what point, when should professionals notify um, the authorities? Um, you know, when somebody's missed their medication or, or what have you, you know, um, is there a period in which, in which uh, you know, law enforcement, state's attorneys should be notified? And will that be in the study? I think that that's the intent of putting this language into the study is if it's going to happen, when should it happen? At what point, uh, with what information uh, and for what purposes? Uh, uh, you know, I think the, the question is, does, you know, for, in, for instance, missing a dose of a medication, telling state's attorneys uh, and, uh, you know, uh, that information What's that useful for? Well, okay. One dose, I can understand not releasing that information, but you know, how many doses before you do notify or, you know. Right, and I think, I think we want to be careful about, about that because A, every individual is different. Um, and uh, you know, I think there's a lot of pieces. And I, again, I think this is the conversation that the study group would get into is, uh, the impacts of, of an individual not taking medications, uh, you know, in this example, um, and what their current presentation is, uh, things of that sort, uh, what their history is, what their history is, you know, like when off medications. Uh, there's a lot of factors, I think, that, that could come into play that, that would need to be considered on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, but again, I think that's that's what the meat of, of the study would, would really need to take a look at. Again, if if that this type of notification could happen uh, for folks who are in, in the community. And, and I guess in many cases, there's no real answer to this question, is there? In some, there won't be. Well, might, if I may, might, might it also be the case that there may be, in terms of what you were saying earlier, uh, 
prior to possible notification of the law of, of the state's attorney or law enforcement is the possibility of a, a revision of, of the uh, order of non-hospitalization, actually adding other provisions to it right. and or the possibility of revocation, which right. would, I mean, so there's, 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 other, there's other steps that it seems that there may be uh, available short of that type of notification. Yeah, but exactly. but I, I'm, I don't pretend to be expert in this area, but it just as I'm listening, right. I'm hearing that, there, that there's, a, there's a degrees of, of actions that could be taken. No, you're exactly right, Chair Lippert, that, you know, there's already within the processes and statute, the ability to amend uh, orders and, uh, you know, different avenues to uh, seek to, you know, and keep keep an individual engaged in their treatment. Um, as long as, you know, that treatment is seen to be, you know, a positive and uh, helpful thing and, and a needed thing. Uh, and as long as it's determined that the person should remain in, in custody. Uh, I think, I mean, it, it does, it does still have the question of, is there a point at which something else needs to happen? And I think that's what I see the study mm -hmm. trying to engage with the study committee trying to engage with. And I think that gets I to part of what Representative Page is asking yes. as well. Representative Goldman. I'm just wondering what the role of the clinicians are in this decision. Is there an intersection between the clinicians and the and the law enforcement and, and how that happens? I mean, if someone's missing a dose of medicine, that seems to be a clinical, pro there is a clinical problem. So I'm just wondering where that fits in, if it does. Well, I guess my, my first response is an individual missing a dose of medication isn't necessarily a clinical problem. There are many reasons why why someone might miss a, a dose of medication. Someone's sick, uh, you know, things of that sort. Pharmacies make mistakes, don't get delivered. Uh, and so I wanna be careful that we don't just say, you missed a dose, doesn't matter why. Um, and no, totally. you know, that, that yeah. that's a clinical problem. No, no. Uh, you know, and I think from a clinician perspective, I think, I think their responsibility is to their client. They're there to provide treatment and support uh, uh, to to the client, uh, and then I think it's on on them as far as their clinical assessments as to how an individual is doing, and you know occasionally you know if they're if they're being successful in the community uh, and living independently, have engaged in services, working, volunteering, etc. Um, you know, those, all those types of factors need to be taken into, into account as they're, you know, working with the individual. Uh, if, if they're starting to fail in the community as a result of uh, not following some of the conditions in the order, that's when, you know, they may approach the department to say, we want to amend the order of non-hospitalization, or we think we need to uh, revoke it. Generally, what happens is they will reach out to us before they get to a place of asking for a revocation to let us know, hey, I think you know this individual is is struggling right now, and it may be that they're in complete compliance of the order, but they're just struggling, uh, and and such, uh, and so we have those conversations. Uh, we also have a care management team at the department that works with each designated agency to review the individuals who are on orders of non hospitalization on a regular basis, just to check in uh, as these are individuals under the care and custody of the commissioner. And so we find it incumbent upon us to make sure we're aware of how they're doing and that it's not just occurring in a vacuum, if you will. Uh, and so we try to keep close clinical tabs too and making you know, recommendations or having those conversations of, should we consider an amendment to their order? Should we consider a revocation? Uh, things of that sort. So there's that consultation piece as well. Yeah, that's very helpful because it seems to me that it's going to start with the clinicians. They're the first ones that are going to notice. So when you say designated agencies, you're actually talking about clinicians. And I'm just learning this system. So that's helpful. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. So it occurs to me, I, I, I'm making certain assumptions, and I shouldn't be in terms of your availability, uh, Fox. What What is your availability to us this morning? Because I I'm we're spending... We need, you guys we need, have me all morning. Oh, well, that's a that's the right answer. So. 
No, I'm pleased, no, seriously, I'm pleased to hear that because yeah. I think because I really I appreciate that as much as anything. But I do I do want to note that we're going to be hearing from uh, a witness at ten, so we may need to pause some of this, hear from them, and then because because they are not available all morning, they are they are going to be available only for a window of time starting at ten. So just so everyone understands that. And yes, the, those doctors and their limited availability. Yeah, you got it. Um, okay, so Representative Page and then Representative Donahue, and then I, I'd like to suggest that we move move on if we can. Okay, um, you mentioned that we have about 300 um, uh, patients, I guess, um, at any one or, or during the year. How many clinicians do we actually have that are that are helping these uh, these um, these individuals? And what and what's what's their what's their background? What's what's their their ability to help these individuals? Uh, well, all of them are seeing a psychiatrist at the designated agency. Uh, yes, and unless unless there's no medications being prescribed, which I would find highly unlikely for an individual on an order of non hospitalization. Um, but and in that case, then I'm sure the psychiatrists are being consulted, uh, but may have decided to. Uh, decrease or or discontinue or not start a medication, uh, but generally they 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 have psychiatry that are following them, uh, and then are working with social workers and case managers, uh, and then it depends on what other services they need. Uh, would they be receiving individual therapy, um, you know, group therapy, um, other other types of supports uh, through the designated agency? Um, so you know, our designated agency has some 5,000 uh, plus employees uh, throughout the designated agencies. Uh, not that they're all involved with individuals on orders of non-hospitalization, but um, I, so yeah, but you know, from a types of, in, types of clinical services and clinical clinicians that they'll be working with, uh, we're talking about psychiatry, social work, mental health counselors, uh, things of that nature. So there's enough to go around to help these I believe so. I think it would be fair to say that uh, individuals who are in what would be the serious mental illness, and I think th these individuals would fall within that category, are those those resources are prioritized. Yes. Representative Donahue, and then let's move on to the next section. So, yeah, I, I mean, I think the... Um... The reason for this bill and so forth is addressing a really important, legitimate issue and concern around um, a danger, public safety, treatment needs for people who have been involved potentially in, uh, or accused of, of violent crimes. But I, I, I don't want to lose, because um, I think the impression there are 300, a little more than 300 folks in any given year on an O&H. And that might create an impression among people that there are 300 plus people who have been accused of a violent crime or on an ONH. And I think it's important to distinguish many of those folks are through the civil system, an ONH through the civil system. I'm just checking yes. that Fox is, <laughs> is nodding. That in other words, they've never, they, they have not even been charged with a crime. And then one can also be on a, an ONH coming in the door from the criminal system, but it does not necessarily mean the charge even was for a violent offense. Right. To Representative Donahue's point, uh, the vast majority of people on orders of non-hospitalization uh, are through civil uh, court, not through uh, criminal court. Um, and also to Representative Donahue's point, uh, many individuals who are placed on orders of non-hospitalization um, through the criminal court are for folks who have not committed violent crimes um, and, and such like that. So uh, to be, yes. And, and, this, and this bill doesn't address civil ONHs at all when this whole discussion, it doesn't even touch on, no. on those. This is only criminal process. Correct. Thank you. Right. It's, 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 those are important distinctions to, in terms of the numbers, particularly it, it could give a completely wrong impression. Yeah. Let's move to, uh, I think we, that's 
that was section three we were mostly talking about there. Uh, so I think four. in section four, um, we're looking at what this bill envisions, I believe, uh, don't know how to actually call it, but J uh, within mm -hmm. section four, uh, submit to a reasonable mental examination by a psychiatrist uh, or other expert when a court ordered examiner pursuant blah, 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 reports that defendant is not competent to stand trial. The way I understand this is that um, this would allow uh, the state's attorneys to uh, have an individual uh, uh, meet with a forensic examiner or expert of their choice uh, beyond just the neutral evaluator uh, that the court may have ordered. Uh, there's been some testimony, I believe from the Defender General um, that phrased this as uh, doctor shopping. Uh, and if the state's attorneys don't like the neutral evaluator's uh, uh, opinion, uh, that they could doctor shop until they found an evaluator whose opinion that they did like. Uh, the def as part of one's natural defense, uh, the defense counsel can also do that. The defense counsel, that's part of an individual's defense, is that defense counsel can uh, hire their own expert. Uh, DMH does not want to get kind of in the middle of who's doctor shopping and who has that ability, but the way I personally, and I think the department, how we view this is that uh, regardless of doctor shopping, um, if the defense has their expert and the state has their expert, in the end, the experts will be cross-examined by lawyers and either the judge or if there's a jury, they will make a decision and a determination as to uh, their whose opinion whose expert opinion uh, that they're going to accept. Uh, so I think we're relatively neutral on, on this piece, but as far as if it were to go forward, I, we would not be opposed to it uh, in that, again, in the end, the judge or the jury will decide whose opinion they're going to accept. Okay. And let me say that I think sections one through four, which we've just gone through are, it's important for us to understand, but they're in large part, really the province of the judiciary committee in terms of some of the judicial, but it's, but I think it gives, it's an important piece for us to understand the context of, of, of what we're, what's being talked about here generally. So, but I, I see those are primarily judiciary decisions. So I see that our, uh, Yes, I think our witness is, uh, has joined our screen, our next witness. And so um, I think what I'm going to do is to welcome, and I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm going to ask you to introduce yourself because I don't, I don't believe we've met before and uh, both introduce yourself by name and your role. We've invited you in, uh, in your role with the Vermont Medical Society. Uh, can yeah, you can hear me. Okay. Uh, we and to say that we've been hearing from uh, Deputy Commissioner Morning Fox, and walking through the sections of the bill. Um, we have not yet reviewed sections five and six, but we've reviewed the other sections and asked the department their point of view on those. And so we thank you for joining us this morning. And we understand you have a, a narrower uh, window in which to be with us. So we'll pause our testimony with, with Deputy Commissioner Fox and uh, welcome your testimony. Oh, thank you so much. And thanks so much for, for having me here. My name is Dr. Simi Ravin and I'm the, the president of Vermont Medical Society. Um, and I'm uh, very pleased to join you and to talk about uh, S3. Um, so I'll, I'll share a little bit of my background yeah, in please. the area. I think that would be um, useful. Yeah. Great, and just to give you some perspective on where, where I'm coming from and my interest in this area. Um, 
So I wear a couple of different hats. I'm the president of the Vermont Medical Society, and I also serve on faculty at UVM in the Department of Psychiatry and for um, many years at Yale University School of Medicine in the Division of Law and Psychiatry. Um, I'm also Chief Medical Officer at Howard Center in Burlington. Um, and I, I just wanted to note that the Vermont Medical Society has identified forensic mental health and forensic mental health infrastructure as, as a real priority. So uh, we share your dedication in this area and I wanna thank you for your work. Um, I'm a forensic psychiatrist, which means I trained as a physician and then in adult psychiatry, um, which is a specialty that focuses on cognitive, psychological, and emotional health. And then I completed additional training in forensic psychiatry, which is a field that kind of has a, a wide umbrella and encompasses both care of people who experience mental illness and have justice involvement um, and also uh, a wide range of psychiatric evaluations for the courts. Um, another piece of the work is violence risk assessment. So in my work, I care for people who experience mental illness and have violence history. Um, I also perform uh, competence to stand trial evaluations and criminal responsibility evaluations and train different clinicians in these areas. Um, let's see, so, and I got sort of interested in this work, particularly uh, the uh, um, strengthening and improving forensic mental health infrastructure in Vermont through my clinical work, first in inpatient settings, now in community mental health settings, when my colleagues and I recognized that there are a number of areas where we can improve our systems of care for people who experience mental illness and have justice involvement. Um, I was really excited to see uh, this, this proposed legislation that has the formation of a forensic mental health working group. Um, and I really see this as the having the potential to um, do a number of things. Um, first, uh, make our communities safer and really support a specific subset of people who experience mental illness and have justice involvement. And it's a very specific and sort of narrow subset, people who have been found not guilty by reason of insanity and people who have been found not competent to stand trial. Um, and my perspective is that having robust community support would, um, prevent people in this, this narrow group from being hospitalized longer than is necessary um, and help people be successful in the community. So sort of to say it another way, when we have uh, appropriate programs for insanity equities or those who've been found not guilty by reason of insanity, uh, those individuals, um, uh, can lead, more, lead fulfilling and um, uh, robust lives in, in, in the communities and our communities are safer. And I think that the formation of this working group would be a first step in that direction. So I have a number of specific comments, if I may. Yes, and then uh, at some point, if you'd be willing to entertain questions as well. I would be happy to um, entertain questions as we go along because I know that it's sometimes hard if I go from topic to topic to, to switch gears. So I'm very happy to um, uh, discuss questions as we as we move along. Great, I'll take the lead in trying to just interrupt you as, as necessary. Sure, I'd be happy, happy to do that. Um, so one of the issues that has come up and is outlined um, in S3 is the separation of evaluations for competence to stand trial and sanity or criminal responsibility evaluations. And um, I wanna thank you for addressing that issue. Um, I strongly support um, the separation of those two kinds of evaluations. Um, I uh, essentially if, and, and I'll, I'll just describe this a little bit. 
um, my understanding is it's, it's uh, if an evaluator is evaluating someone's competence to stand trial and they recommend, they would recommend that an individual be found not competent to stand trial, they would stop there and not perform a criminal responsibility or sanity evaluation. And I think that that is really the, the um, most ethical and appropriate um, way to go rather than having someone go forward with a criminal responsibility or sanity evaluation um, for someone who would be recommended to be found not competent. Um, and I'll, I'll explain why. Um, really an incompetent defendant really can't adequately participate in that criminal responsibility evaluation. Um, because uh, essentially if somebody is found incompetent or recommended to be found incompetent, the evaluator is saying that they have an impairment that impairs one of the two prongs of um, competence. The ability to work with an attorney or to meaningfully negotiate and understand the um, court system. Um, and that sounds like a really high bar, but in practice, it's a pretty low Bar. It's not, uh, sometimes when I'm working with trainees, they ask, you know, there are often difficult relationships with attorney and client, um, but it's not the ability to work with a specific attorney, but the general ability to work with any attorney. Um, and on the other hand, um, the other prong, um, negotiating the criminal justice system and the court system is really very complicated but what we're, what we're looking at when we evaluate competence to stand trial, it's not a quiz of can you navigate the legal system, but an ability to learn to do that and to understand sort of the very basic framework. Some of the questions we ask are, um, who is the judge? What does the judge do? Um, what is the role of a defense attorney? Are they on your side? Are they on the other side? what is evidence, and then we'll do some education and then um, see if people are able to, return, to retain that. Um, so it's uh, just to um, note also that the American Academy of Psychiatry and Law and the American Bar Association strongly recommend separating these two evaluations and not performing a, a, comp, a, a criminal responsibility evaluation when someone is not competent to stand trial. And, and I, I guess I should just also make clear, these, these, this, these few sections of the bill in sections one through four are the primary responsibility of our House Judiciary Committee, which, who has jurisdiction of the bill. I see. Uh, yeah, just so. And so we're, I don't intend for us to try to take extensive testimony on all sides of this issue. Uh, there may be others who hold a different point of view, but we have heard that the department also shares your support for this. Um, then I'll, I'll uh, gladly move on to other, other pieces of it. Sure. Um, one, of the, one of the pieces that um, caused some concern for me uh, was in section C. Is this an area? that this committee is, is looking at. It's, it's around notification to the criminal courts um, of non-adherence to orders of non-hospitalization. And, and again, if I may, uh, that we, it's, we were just, we've just been talking about this, the Department of Mental Health has indicated their support for taking this out of the bill and putting okay. it into the study. Uh, and again, I think we've heard indirectly and informally that the House Judiciary Committee intends to do the same. So I'm just trying to not have us belabor uh, issues that have already, uh, so I, 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 think, I think that, that that's the direction we understand that they're going and that, uh, so I'm happy to hear your comment, but I don't think we'll get into it deeply. So, sounds good, I, I support the, that as well. I think it's a complex issue and should be the work of the, of the work group, both the logistics of it and the dynamics of it. And as a, a clinician, I'll just, I'll make one comment as a clinician that um, 
uh, it brought up a conflict for me that when I'm working with people clinically, I see myself as um, allying with them and being sort of in their corner and having um, and this a robust notification requirement would create a bind where I would feel that I'm sort of reporting on my my patients and having that be the the work of the work group to think think through how to do that practically and thoughtfully makes a lot of sense to me. Um, I think I'm just. So I guess my, my last comment would be to emphasize the importance of the work group and um, urge uh, um, adequate resources to be put um, towards the work of that group so that expert consultation can be uh, included. And I'm very, very happy to answer any questions that have come up. Well, I would like to, you, you used a phrase earlier, which I, and I'd like to, in terms of the, the, the charge to the work group, I'd, I'd be interested in understanding and given your, your background. Um, you, you mentioned, I believe, the having robust community support uh, for and, and forensic infrastructure. And I'm, I'm wondering if uh, you can help me or us understand whether that translates necessarily into a free, into an individual freestanding or a, a specific freestanding forensic unit as a, uh, 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 or if there are other ways, other community infrastructure that also would be part of potentially addressing uh, some of these issues. I, I think that, that, that would be something I'd, you know, if you, if you would comment on, I'd appreciate. Sure, I, I think that those are um, uh, somewhat somewhat separate. I do support having a freestanding forensic um, hospital or unit. I think um, having the mechanism to have um, I, I have that kind of treatment separate potentially separated from general civil commitment and general clinical care is important. Um, in terms of community uh, forensic programs, I, I actually see that as somewhat separate. And there are two areas where I think that we could really um, use other kinds of community programs we don't have in Vermont. Um, the first that comes to mind that I think is a real gap, and I hope is the work of that work group, is competence restoration. Um, when someone is found not competent to stand trial in Vermont, we don't have a formal program that helps them gain or regain competence. Um, other states have formal programs that exist both in hospital and community settings where people who've been found not competent have a combination of sort of essentially kind of classes to help support um, Comp them gaining or regaining competence to stand trial. Uh, and one element of that is sometimes uh, treatment, um, mental health treatment and sort of classwork. Um, the literature reflects that the majority of people who undergo competence restoration uh, and go through competence restoration programs regain competence. So we kind of have a missed opportunity here where most of the people who, have found, who are found not competent to stand trial uh, ultimately don't regain competence uh, or gain competence and resolve their uh, criminal charges. So that's a, um, a significant portion of individuals who don't um, then um, go forward and resolve their uh, criminal charges. Um, whereas the literature shows that most people, the, the range is 60 to 80% can be restored to competence. Um, and I think that's a really important uh, um, gap. Um, so that's, yeah. So you, so that, that is referenced in the charge to the working group. So I'm, I'm hearing your support for that being part of the charge to look at competency re restoration models. Yes. Uh, and, and the other area of uh, sort of community support is, is sort of much broader. There are a, a, a me, sort of a menu of community forensic programs with um, 
uh, varying data and evidence behind them about that serve to support people who have who experience mental illness and, and have criminal justice involvement. And that's sort of a, a, a wide group. Um, everyone from people who have been found not guilty by reason of insanity and are transitioning to the community to make sure that the people who fall in that group have both robust clinical support that is um, focused on and has expertise in that area to more practical supports around um, housing and other practical things. And I think, and, um, and I think that though that people are most likely to be successful when there are specialized uh, supports in the community. Right now, we, we don't have those kinds of specialized supports in our communities. So can I ask you this would be, I think some, there's some assumption and maybe rightly or wrongly so on the part of the general public and many of us who don't work in this field that if someone were to be hospitalized in a specific forensic unit that that would be, uh, that they would not ever be discharged to the community. And I think there's some general, and so can you comment on that? Because sure. I think what you're, what I'm, as I'm hearing you, you're suggesting that someone might be part of a specialized forensic unit and at some point transition into the community as well. So it's uh, exceedingly rare to non-existent that someone is hospitalized indefinitely. And I think that that's a good thing. We don't want people to be, when somebody is is ill and um, has uh, there's a tragedy and they um, harm someone else or have uh, and are found not guilty by reason of insanity. Uh, the aim is to support people so that they can be well and um, maintain their health and transition in a um, safe and supported and successful way to the community. Um, people do not spend their lives in psychiatric hospitals. Um, and that's, oh, that's I, think, a, I think that's, I think there may be more of understanding that, but I think oh. there may be less of an understanding that if someone's in a forensic hospital, that they might not, that that might be seen as an alternative to incarceration. And that there might be a longer period of time served there, served, if you will, or there. So I, I'm, I'm just posing questions which I think are out there and maybe some assumptions. And, and again, I'm, your comments are welcome. I see. Um, I guess I, I'm not, I, I hope I understand your, your question correctly. It sounds like um, there, you're saying that there's a, an assumption that if someone is committed to a forensic hospital, that they stay there for a long period of time, sort of as an alternative to incarceration. Is that is that it? Yes, I think there's I think there is an assumption by many people that if only we had a forensic unit, we could make sure that they're there for a very long period of time. So, from my view, the um, the aim is not to have people out of the community and hospitalized for long periods of time. Um, I think that sometimes. I mean, and some, sometimes that happens when there aren't robust supports in the community and we can't transition people. I think the aim is to have appropriate treatment, which sometimes takes some time. And that appropriate treatment um, usually starts in a hospital setting and continues in a community setting. And I would say what we in Vermont have the opportunity to do is to have more uh, more of that treatment happen in a robust way with specialized services uh, in a community setting so that people can transition um, out of hospitalization effectively uh, and, and safely and successfully. Okay, let me turn to others who have quit. If, if you, can you take a few more questions from her? Yeah, uh, Representative Peterson, then Representative Donahue. Yes, thank you, uh, Chair Lippert. Uh, uh, doctor, thank you for your testimony. Um, you, you mentioned 60 to 80 percent of the, the folks that are not, not competent to stand trial can be uh, restored to competency. Uh, and, and are we missing out on all that now? I mean, we don't have the forensic facility per se, but 
we have other facilities where we, I assume, can can work with these folks and and get them to the competent level so that they can then stand trial. Is that happening in Vermont? So I'll, I'll speak to my knowledge of it, but this would really be an issue that um, Deputy Commissioner Fox can speak to more uh, in more detail. Um, if, in my experience, uh, some people, their competence is restored through general um, treatment. And uh, I think some people are captured that way that they uh, um, do um, regain or gain competence, but I think it's a very small proportion compared to a formal competence restoration program. Okay, so we, we don't have the formal uh, program is what you're saying. That's and, exactly and does, right. And does that formal program require a facility separate from something else or is it, can, can, could it not be done in, you know, a couple rooms in a, in an existing hospital or setting? So competence restoration programs are sometimes done in hospital settings, often start in hospital settings, um, but also are done successfully in the community. Okay. So people live at home for, for people who are able to live at home and then do it as um, uh, uh, in, in a community-based setting. Okay, so that so, can be more, um, that doesn't work for everyone, but it does work for some people. Okay, so, so uh, uh, someone commits a, a, a horrendous crime of some kind, okay, found not competent to stand trial, not, not insane at the time, but incompetent to stand trial. They're in the hospital, they're being worked with, but then they're put in, in, a, in a community facility somehow and, and, and then worked with there. Is that how the the flow would go, so to speak? So I think there are, there are a number of different ways this can work. Um, the competence restoration programs, that's one of the pieces that is very flexible. Uh, there are people who have been found not competent to stand trial on relatively, relatively minor charges. And that's someone who maybe could go back to their family home. And if they have the structure and support, I uh, could, for instance, go to um, go someplace and work with someone to through a curriculum and receive the um, medical care that they need. Um, but you bring up a really interesting point too of someone who has um, maybe harmed someone in a more significant way is found not competent to stand trial um, and is in a um, hospital, uh, psychiatric hospital setting. That's also a setting where uh, many states have their competence restoration programs within forensic hospitals, and that is that is more the um, uh, more the norm. So, so there's evidence folks, on a range of models. So those folks would probably, if, if the crime is severe, that they would probably stay in there and be worked with rather than released um, to a home or, or, yeah. I think the two, cra the two things that would be considered are how, how ill is that person and what kind of treatment do they need? And then it's also important to consider um, risk, uh, um, violence risk. So both of those things are, are important considerations for the context. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Donahue. Yes, uh, uh, thank you, Doctor. Um, this is jumping the gun on the same question I want to ask DMH, but um, but we hadn't gotten to that part of the the bill yet. Um, I'm I'm looking at the scope of the work group, uh, the charge for the work group, which just in addition to hearing you testify, we're talking about uh, competency restoration programs, whether we should create one and what it would look like the notification to victims issues when somebody's in the community, the uh, an issue of states that have not guilty by reason of insanity, but also guilty but mentally ill, uh, whether or not we need a forensic facility, uh, what it should look like and what effect that might have on length of hospitalization or being in a facility. 
um, treatment program options in the community um, and uh, recommended draft language for statutory revisions if that's required for any of these things. So I'm wondering, and I know the issue of length of time has been raised, but beyond that, I'm wondering about um, the, the number of members in the work group and, mm -hmm. uh, and their makeup in terms of their stakeholder interests versus expertise in these assorted issues. How uh, successful do you think this work group is? You know, what, what, what's, the, what's the prognosis for the, for the outcome that's being hoped for in your um, opinion? Yeah. So from my view, it's really important that the work group has enough time to really uh, delve into and evaluate a number of really complicated issues that you've uh, uh, delineated. So I think that having adequate time and, and I think the, the minimum amount of time that I can imagine is six to 12 months. Um, and then having resources for that work group um, because I, I think it would be a much richer discussion if we can bring in um, regional and national expertise. Thank you. Is that, uh, so, so can I also just make a comment? Because I think some of us are also learning as we, hear witnesses and testimony. And I think the re indirectly what I was hearing in part from your testimony is that uh, being found not competent in Sam trial does not equate with having committed what many people would say is a horrendous crime. That's, or that, that's that, exactly right, yes. And I, but I think, that, I think the two get conflated yes. uh, often and yeah. uh, that there may be, there are instances of individuals who are found not competent to stand trial for whom the criminal charge, which is an alleged charge at that point still, but who, with whom, for whom the alleged charge could be in fact relatively minor, uh, Certainly. But, the, but they were found not competent to stand trial. And I think that goes to what Representative Peterson was asking about uh, who, the kind of the dichotomy of who can be part of a competency restoration process in the community versus in, an, in a hospital setting, et cetera, and safety and risk issues. But not all, again, just to reiterate, not all individuals who are found not competent to stand trial pose a risk to the community um, by nature of the crime or the risk that they otherwise would pose. Am I, am I understanding that properly? I think that's absolutely right. And, and my work uh, performing not, uh, competence to stand trial evaluations and supervising uh, trainees who are learning how to do that, it's a wide, very, very wide range um, of both uh, risk and severity of the charges. Okay, that, that's, that's helpful for me to kind of make that delineation as well. And that's not to say that there aren't there aren't in instances where there is a, you know, a, a, a tremendously horrific alleged crime because they haven't been adjudicated fully, but, uh, but, and where they might not also, and where they might also be not competent to stand trial. Uh, Representative Donahue. Yeah, if I could just add to that, because I think it's important for people to know that, that in Vermont statute, a not guilty by reason of insanity also does not necessarily mean that there was a uh, uh, proof um, or any kind of conviction of the crime. Yeah. Yeah, I but, think- I mean, so in some states that finding requires finding of underlying facts that show that the crime actually did get committed, but the person was insane. But Vermont law does not require that factual finding uh, in statute. Um, for somebody to be found not guilty by reason of insanity. So they also have not been proven to have committed the crime necessarily. Okay. Other questions for Dr. Is it? Raven. Raven, thank you. I, I want to make sure I try to hear your name properly. Raven. Uh, Representative Page. Yes, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Doctor. Um, when somebody has created, has committed allegedly a horrendous crime and goes to this forensic facility and then is declared competent. 
do they then go and be tried for the crime that they initially did? And if yeah. so, if that's the case, then do they go in? And if they are, this is a whole realm of, of items, but if they are then declared uh, competent to stand trial, uh, charges are brought to them and then they're found guilty, do they then go into the correctional system or do they go into a different facility? It seems to me kind of sad. I understand it, but it seems kind of sad that, okay, you were declared incompetent, then become competent, you then go to trial. You see where I'm going with this? It just seems so very sad to me, you know, like for, for everyone, for everyone involved, you know? I think we are talking about, you know, we're, we're, we're talking about, we are talking about um, tragic, you know, the situations that are potentially tragic and very sad. Um, and I, I, I can um, maybe delineate a little bit of the, the pathway that you're alluding to. I, I think you're, you're exactly right. If someone is found not competent to stand trial and they go through a program or regain competence through treatment, they would then work with their attorney to elect a um, defense strategy um, and potentially go through trial and they could be um, potentially found guilty, not guilty, or if, the, if they want to elect a, an uh, insanity defense, they could be found not guilty by reason of insanity. Um, so the, there are multiple different outcomes. And there are many reasons someone may be not competent and then regain competence. It's, it's fairly broad and some people have long lasting impairment of competence and some for some people it's transient. And, and I guess to follow up, do they then go into the correctional system if they're found guilty or is it a special, uh, another type of treatment uh, facility or long-term facility for them? If someone was, uh, if a question of competence came up and somebody and someone were then evaluated for competence to stand trial, um, found not competent, but regained competence, um, then they would, uh, they would, and found, ultimately found guilty, they would go to corrections. As, as, as they would if they had not been found not competent to stand trial initially. That's exactly right. And, and, the, and there was not an insanity defense subsequently. Okay, uh, Representative Peterson. Yes, uh, and this may be a, thank you, Chair, and, and thank you, Doctor. This may be a, a question that that might be crazy, but do, do, I think it's relevant. Um, the people game the uh, game the system. I'll use that uh, phrase when it comes to competency to stand trial. Can they can they play a game, and is that is that found out in the in 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 the ensuing um, questioning psychiatric help to, to to make sure that those who are trying to get away with a crime, you know, uh, all of a sudden are incompetent to stand trial. I mean, does that happen, and does it happen frequently? In my experience, it's exceedingly rare. Um, people generally don't want to be found not competent to stand trial. Um, it's, I think um, it can it often be embarrassing to people to, to um, be found not competent to stand trial. Um, and but a qualified psychiatrist, a qualified psychiatrist can make that determination probably pretty quickly. So there are actually, I, I think generally so. There are really rigorous guidelines put out by the American Academy of Psychiatry and Law about how to conduct competence to stand trial evaluations. And they're quite rigorous about um, record gathering, um, questioning of collateral, people in the individual's life and treaters, as well as questions um, that take place in the, in the actual interview with the individual. Um, and it's um, 
fairly regimented uh, and quite rigorous. Um, and I, it, one of the things one looks at in competence to stand trial as with most forensic evaluations is malingering or deliberate misrepresentation um, for a specific goal. Thank you. Uh, Raven Goldwyn. Good morning and thank you for testifying. Um, I was just thinking about your the following these questions about an individual who is found competent to stand trial. So goes through that whole process and then lands in corrections. And I imagine that's pretty individual, but are there programs and corrections that can support this individual or are they pretty much left to the system now in the corrections world? How does that work? So they would essentially be treated like anyone else um, going into the correctional system. And as we, we know, um, pe people who struggle with mental illness and substance use disorders are overrepresented in our correctional settings and their healthcare um, uh, resources in corrections. Um, so they would essentially be like any, anyone else going into the correctional setting. And I think there is a provision in this bill to do an assessment, uh, an, uh, an, an inventory, if you will, of the ability, the availability of mental health services for individuals in corrections, as a, in it, as compared to those in the community. So, this is it's not to say that there are adequate resources, but there, this, there is as a part of this proposal. There's a there's a section to say let's do an inventory to find what is. What is the current status of that? I, I do think Representative Goldman, you allude to something important that I think is aside from this bill, but important to mention here, um, uh, court diversion uh, programs that look at people who really shouldn't be in corrections. And this is before, usually before people have criminal charges, but divert people from the court system into um, different kinds of treatment structures. Okay, other questions uh, for Dr. Robin? Oh, I'm Representative Black. Um, thank you, Doctor. Um, so I guess I'm trying to, I'm trying to understand. So I, you know, I watched a lot of the testimony in both Senate and House Judiciary. Um, and I'm thinking about, um, I'm thinking about several high profile cases. Um, in particular, I'm thinking about um, Kelly Carroll, I believe is her name, the, or Carol Kelly, the mother of the young woman in Bennington who has testified um, in both um, committees. What in S3, it, I mean, it seems to me S3 seems to be um, responding to a lot of these instances. What particularly in it, what are we missing in our system now that it addresses so that we're not having these situations um, rather than just responding to them once they've happened? Can you speak to that at all? Or am I misreading? I'm not sure I know enough about the um, instance you're referring to to fully understand the question. I have some passing familiarity, but wasn't able to uh, see the testimony. I, I guess I'm addressing, does it address any of the concerns before something is, I don't know. I. It, it just seems to be in response to situations happening rather than preventing them. And you know, we we talked about with the corrections, this revolving door between corrections and the Department of Mental Health. Is is this working group, this study group, is anything that they're going to be doing addressing these issues before they happen rather than responding to them after they happen? So it's, I, I think you're talking about the potential to prevent 
um, people experiencing, you know, the very uh, uh, rare but um, tragic instances when someone who experiences mental illness uh, um, is violent towards another and commits a, a crime or kills another person. And, and I just wanna um, highlight here that, that while this happens, it's exceedingly rare. Most, most people who experience mental illness are more, more likely to be victimized than to hurt others, but it's still an enormously important um, uh, to prevent those tragedies. Um, there's a, a um, body of work uh, sort of encompassed by uh, it's sort of a, a, a fancy term, the sequential intercept model, which looks at ways of diverting people from the criminal justice system to treatment and making sure that people um, are sort of intercepted at different places um, uh, and receive treatment rather than have justice involvement. The most basic foundation of that is good uh, access to good mental health treatment. Um, and I, I don't think that this work group addresses that specifically though uh, um, uh, there, there are many organizations and individuals who, who do. Thank you. Bill, you're on mute. I was seeing if there were any further questions and not seeing any at this time. Uh, wanted to thank Dr. Robin for bringing your expertise and to uh, say that we're fortunate to have you working in our, our uh, system of care here in Vermont. As I understand, you have a, as you said, I believe, are you now the medical director for the Howard Center? Is that I have that uh, right? That's correct, and and thank you, and thank you all for your your work on this. Great, thank you very much. I thanks so much. So, uh, committee, I'm going to suggest that we take a uh, stretch from the screen, and uh, so this is I it's 10:35. Um, let's let's take a break till 10:45. Uh, go off YouTube, go off screen, and go mute. Uh, uh, and then we'll come back and follow up with uh, Deputy Commissioner Morning Fox.